Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD podcast. Man, Troy, we took a little break. That was the first time we we had a little break from each other in a while over the holidays and stuff, man. It has been uh, it has been three it's more than three years, man. I can't believe this, Brian. It's been yeah, more it's been than crazy. three years. We've interviewed more than uh, it's got to be 200, 200 plus or somewhere near that, right? Yeah. Now we're starting to get the big names on, man. We finally made a name for ourselves, so we get we. Well, you can you can do the announcement of who we have today. Yeah, so this is an interesting story. So I, I was going back uh, through the old rambunctious uh, comments I've made in the past, and you know I'm eating a little bit of humble pie. So, so I actually met uh, Dr. Jacob May, who is a registered dietitian. He's a PhD and an RD. He studies human uh, nutrition. He's had he has clinical experience. He's done work on ketones. He's also uh, has two new studies out that are top 15 in ASN in terms of most impressions and most read and trending. Uh, one of which is a study on whole grains versus processed grains and their effect on, on I think it was body composition, if I'm not mistaken. And then um, the uh, another study that caught my eye was his name was on the carnivore study. So his Twitter handle is Cake Nutrition. And he's doing research on carnivore. So I was like, damn, you know. And I'm he's a buff dude too, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a he's a previous, I think he played college football. And we've crossed paths before. You know, we've met uh, maybe three or four years back at an obesity medicine conference. And uh, this like 6'2 guy freaking like, you know, stacked up, you know, threatened to beat me up for my Twitter uh, rambunctious. No, that I'm just kidding. That never happened. Um, so, um, it was actually me saying, damn, please don't beat me up, you know, from my Twitter <laughs> rambunctious comments. So look, Dr. Jacob may, um, I'm happy to have you here. I'm eating a little humble pie, which is fine. We all deserve a little humble pie. You know, Rosette will make sure it's low carb and, uh, and I'm happy to have you here. And, uh, let's, let's, how did you get, so let's start. How did you get started? When did you say, you know what, I'm going to become a registered dietitian because I got to be honest with you. um, I've been interested in healthcare for 20 years and there's not a time in my life where I was like, Oh, I can't wait to see that dietitian. (laughs) So help me understand what made you actually, to be honest, I was, I was, I'm, I was looking into it myself. You know, I was debating it myself. So go ahead. How did you get started? Well, first off, thank you guys so much for having me on. This is an awesome podcast. And so I'm, I'm happy to be here uh, and chat with some low carb people, you know, just just a heads up for everyone. I'm not um, quite as a, a huge outward proponent of like the ketogenic low carb diet, but I am I do recognize its potential clinical utility. And so I, I love what you guys are doing. Uh, really cool stuff, just kind of spreading information. Uh, and I think that's always a good thing, especially what you guys do in clinic which is like, what else do we want to do as healthcare practitioners other than to help people? And I think you guys do that in a a unique and special way. So very, very cool. Happy to be on. Um, In terms of my interest, man, uh, I've I've always had issues with um, obesity, like since I was a kid, right? So like fifth, sixth grade, I was probably one of the heaviest kids in school, but I always played sports. So I was athletic. And then uh, came into junior junior high football and they're like, Hey man, you got to weigh less than 135 to carry the football. I'm like, well, that's messed up, dude. How am I going to, how am I going to do that? So, um, uh, I, I, I did the kid, the Atkins ketogenic diet. My dad was, uh, you know, a, uh, avid weightlifter back in his day. And so he's like, Hey man, try this out. And so that's what I did. So that was like my first, I'll, I'll never forget the first feeling I had where I had this drastic change to my diet. I, I tried to lose weight plenty of times before it's hard as a kid, but this is sixth um, grade. You did Atkins. This was seventh grade. Yeah. Go, seventh going into eighth. Yeah. But I, I, I went into Atkins and I'll never forget like how my whole body felt different and it wasn't all good right? Like the energy was low. I had headaches, but, but I'll never forget that situation where I was like, whoa, nutrition really affects your body. 
that's kind of crazy, you know, and we'd heard things about like, you are what you eat and all that, but that's when it it really hit home for me early on. But I kind of left that to the side and kept my educational route separate from my nutrition interests. Yeah. I'd imagine being like a seventh grader, very insulin sensitive, going on low carb. I mean, keto flu would be like the, uh, a light way of describing it. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was brutal. Um, but, but the, you know, the, the downsides and the upsides, I, I made weight. I, I got to play running back. It was the only time I ever played running back in football again, by the way, I was not a good running back. Uh, I, I played offensive line in high school and then defensive line in college, uh, played up at, um, Case Western. I played a nose tackle for them freshman through junior mm. year. I had a nose guard in high school, but I was too small. I wasn't six two, man. So I didn't get a playing ball. <laughs> so I had to go to medicine. <laughs> six two are like my football stats with cleats on. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, I made I, it. I made it. I was like six foot at some point on my football stats. I was really yeah. nice with, them, with the helmet, with the helmet and shoes and everything. But but yeah. So uh, you, anyway, you try, when you're cutting as a kid, you know, because I I was there too. Same thing. Struggled with obesity. Uh, dad wasn't a bodybuilder, but you know, I did all sorts of crazy stuff. So help me understand, did you do anything else as a kid? I mean, isn't it terrible that we like, you know, the pressure we put on kids to lose weight and what they do. Like I remember in, in high school gym class, like people putting garbage bags over them and kind of like running through the hallways. Brian, did you do anything like that? I wrestled, man. So all these guys, you would see like the morning of weigh-ins, it was people were rolling themselves up in wrestling mats and running and spitting and making themselves bleed, punching themselves in the nose to make themselves bleed a little bit to make weight. It was insane, man. What people did. That's, that's crazy. It wasn't did quite you, bad. So did I did you, wrestle for one year, um, heavyweight though. So I didn't have to do any of the crazy. That's crazy good. Yeah. Uh, that's a good weight, man. But did you do anything out there? Did you do any other oh, crazy? I, I wouldn't call it crazy. So like, I mean, I, I was, I was always like a, a smart kid or whatever, you know, so you, you, you get magazines and you read them and you kind of see what's in there. Right. Um, so I did uh, slim fast meal replacements for a little bit that helped, uh, you know, a couple pounds, but it just, it wasn't really doing it. Cause I would just overeat at the other meals. Um, I moved to the Ensure meal replacements and for whatever reason, those worked actually pretty well for me. But I need so you're clothes. buying Ensure like you're a you're like 11th grade buying Ensure. Oh, and- dude, I, I this was this was back when Ensure was in. I don't know if you remember this. They were in like aluminum cans. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You yeah. can break them. Yeah, yeah they yeah, were like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like that's weird- that's way back when I when I use the the Ensure. Yeah, I uh, I use my paper route money on that stuff, man. That was just that was just what I did. Uh, but the weight loss wasn't going fast enough and I needed to make weight for, for football. So then I went over to, to Atkins. Um, but yeah, so I, I tried those other things. You know, it's it's tough too when you don't have like my mom and dad were always fit, right? But they they were fit because they just like just generally ate well and like didn't convert to like that fast food sort of lifestyle. And for whatever reason, the food around us as a kid, I overate. None of my other siblings did. It was really just a me. It was it was an it was an issue with me with what I was doing within my environment, you know. Um, so, but it, it was like, yeah, it's it's tough as someone who is struggling with obesity. And you just don't have the resources, which are often expensive, to be able to to find where to go. And the ketogenic route was like the fast track for me. It just like was easy. I could do it within the means where we were living, and you know, that, that's how it went. So, so what happens next? I'm just curious. Okay, so you did diets. You understand the power. You got crazy keto flu, and you're a smart kid. You're playing football. Where did you, where did you end up playing football? So I, I played football. My um, I played football in high school, but then I, I played in uh, college at Case Western. I went there as an engineering major, and uh, you know you have your the engineer. engineering. <laughs> no, we we have. I, it's always the engineers showing up to the doctors. Yeah, because you think differently, right? Yeah, it's totally true. I don't know what it is. It is kind of funny how like there's just a lot of engineers here. But so I, I went to Case to be an engineer. Um, and on the side, I just kept reading about nutrition. The goal at the time was athletics, right? I wanted my biceps to be bigger, right? I, I wanted to be bigger, faster, stronger for athletics or otherwise. Right. And were you pretty bulked up at that time playing in college? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm about the size, the size I am now. I probably had more muscle and and a little less fat back then, but, uh, yeah, my playing weight was like somewhere over the three years, probably 225 up to 245. 
Um, and then like, I would always just personally for just completely vain reasons, I like to cut down to abs in the off season. So then I'd cut weight in the off season and then go back up and, you know. and how were you cutting weight when you were doing that? Just uh, cutting I, your calories and exercising more or what? Yeah. Yeah. I typically did like three workouts a day. It was a ton of cardio. Cause you have a short yeah. window in the off season to do it. It, it. I wouldn't recommend the route I went. It wasn't like a super healthy route. It was just something I did because. But the smart thing is when you came back and, you know, in, in the fall, you were in good shape. You weren't struggling. Everyone else was drinking beers and hanging out and going, oh, throwing up a practice. Yeah, I always I always did. All right. But um, yeah, so so that was that was football. And then I, I guess it was really my sophomore year where I noticed I was spending so much of my free time on the like reading nutrition, reading PubMed, reading other things. Right. Um, just like following through with what I was doing in high school, but you just had more time in high school. So now I'm in college and I'm sacrificing engineering homework and reading time for nutrition time. And I, I wasn't doing well in my engineering classes because of that. Yeah, because um, you find your passion and you go, this is what I want to do. And you, when you, that's when you know you're doing what you love to do. Yeah, you're, you're dead on. So I was just like, forget this, man. Maybe there's a way for me to do like nutrition for my career. And so I, I transferred over. I was a nutrition student and, and that was kind of the, the turning point in where I was going engineering to, to taking what I just love to do 24 seven and turning that into what I can do 24 seven. That's awesome, man. So then, so how'd you progress? You go to nutrition school, they teach you all this stuff. Yeah. So, so then, then the plan was like, all right, I'm going to get a nutrition degree. What do I do from there? The plan at the time was my, my dad was a small business owner um, in, in Cleveland, Ohio. So at the time I was like, you know what? I'll just, I'll own my own like personal training business, but I, I want a nutrition t- degree to go behind it. Right. Just to kind of separate yourself from like the, all the other amazing people that are doing that sort of work. Right. And then um, one thing that was really important for me was finding like mentors at case that pushed me down a certain route that like pushed you to do better and like do things beyond what you thought was kind of possible. So like I I grew up a a pretty low income kid. So like my goal was to like get a job where I could make, you know, $34,000 a year and like do that. And then I, I did it. There wasn't a thought of like, is this really what I love to do or otherwise? And so then you have mentors that are saying like, Hey, there's so much beyond like just getting enough money to like, to like live. You can, you can do impactful things. You can get into the healthcare field and otherwise. And so there was just some phenomenal mentors at, at Case Western um, that really pushed me to, to kind of go further. Um, and that's when I decided to like get involved in research. And so it was at Case Western. I don't know if you guys know the location of like Case Western and the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, but like Case Western's here and like Cleveland Clinic is like right here, like right by each other. Right. So um, I remember I was, this was, must have been probably junior ish year in undergrad. And I had had these talks with my Case Western mentors and they're like, hey, man, you know, you, you got to look into this. And someone had mentioned research. And so I'm like, all right, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. You know, one of the things where you just kind of sit back and like view the future world and think about it. And then uh, I sent a cold email to Dr. John Kerwin at the Cleveland Clinic, who at the time was one of the most highly established metabolic nutrition researchers at the Cleveland Clinic, right? And I'm just some random undergrad kid, send him an email and I'm just like, hey man, I love what you do. Is there any way I could, you know, volunteer in your lab or, or get experience? And I, I was just thinking, all right, send this guy an email. I won't, I won't hear back. And um, I still have the email saved to this day because John came back and said, yeah, come on in, let's talk about it. And, and from there, I've been really working with John almost ever since wow, I, I started so cool. doing undergrad work at the Cleveland clinic. I did my PhD under one of his um, former mentees. And then I came back and now I'm working with him at Pennington Biomedical Research Center, where he's now the executive director of the whole research center. So, um, you know, there, there's something to be said about like following your passion, but also like really following those mentors that are trying to push you in the in the right direction or in a positive direction and like use that momentum to keep going. Yeah, and so I'm not just reaching out, just having the courage to reach out and go, hey, <clears throat> throw it out there. It's not, yeah, they can, all, the worst thing they can do is say no, right? Yeah. So now what has it transformed into? 
Yeah. So, so now like I get to be something I like, never in my wildest dreams as a kid, right. Growing up in Cleveland was like, Oh man, I'll definitely be able to like go be a researcher someday. Researchers to me were like astronauts. Like there was like, okay, that's like a cool thing you could wish for, but like, let's have a real plan to see what you can do with your life. Right. And so now I'm sitting here. I mean, honestly, man, I'm just having a great time. I get to do nutrition research and it's just, it's fun. I get to do stuff like this and chat with people and I'm a registered dietitian as well. So I get to do one-on-one -on -one counseling of a side private practice, a very small one. Um, but like, it's, man, it's, it's a, it's a great life. I really can't complain about how the whole process has went. So what are big things you've learned along the way where you go, okay, guys, let me set you guys straight on a couple of things. <laughs> Because I'm learning. I mean, I'm seeing stuff now, Tro, still, and I go, wow, this is pretty cool. I, like, I we're learning still, stuff, man. You know, I still can't come up with a reason to eat carbohydrate other than preference or hypoglycemia. So Let's see what Jake, Jake says, man. It was like the Tro Jake show can here. Tell me, Tro, am I off? Is, can I, is there a reason other than symptomatic hypoglycemia and, uh, and preference for me to have carbo? Is there, is there, is there, Am I, am I crazy? You know, for, for you in particular, that might be the case. I would say once you, once you move and bring in that athletic world, I think it really changes the game. Um, and I think you have a lot of people even doing casual athletics that still benefit from the carbohydrates. And so I think, you know, it, it gets a little dicey to, to have kind of a broad recommendation when you have kids like kids like myself, right back in uh, junior high and high school, if I was on a low carb diet, maybe I wouldn't have been as good at football. Just because. yeah, we should be. So we should be very clear. We're talking about the the you know fifty to seventy percent of uh, of the average you know American. So I think you're absolutely right. You know, very insulin sensitive people. It is a completely different dynamic, right? So young people, athletes, they have you know absolutely have unique needs. Um, I was just being a little cheeky. No, no, I, yeah. I, I get it. And so like, I, I, I figured so, um, but just, just, to, just to clarify, you know, that's, that's where I would see that, you know, when you look at the general population, like food preference is important. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to underline how important food preference is. And I'm, I'm also like a, so here at Pennington, I was also on, um, an NIH T32, which is like a training grant to get you experience in a, in a certain area. And that was on botanical compounds that could um, impact like metabolic syndrome and, and, and improve it. And so botanical compounds being things from plants and grains and otherwise. So I, I do think there's like something- Like polyphenols and antioxidants yeah, and- Absolutely, these things, you know? and all, all these things. And yeah, so can you help me? Can you help me? Because I, I you know, we see this a lot. I, I see a lot of plant-based researchers uh, touting the benefits of, for example, I saw a cardiologist very recently say, buy this high resveratrol wine, right? This is the most, this is the wine you should buy because there's the most antioxidants. So when I, when I looked into the literature for any sort of major out, outcomes on uh, vitamin use, uh, polyphenol use, antioxidant use, you know, you kind of run into this, um, uh, I, I don't see a huge clinical impact, but tell me if I'm, I mean, not to say they don't have impacts. Like I've seen pistachio supplementation improve, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, self-perception of erectile strength, for example, you know, I've seen, you know, um, studies showing that polyphenols, you know, or, or fiber rich foods are associated with a, a, wide diversity of microbiota, right? So like these very nebulous clinical endpoints, but I've never seen any major like, you know, uh, you know, hey, this polyphenol supplementation reversed NASH, which I know is an area that you've studied in the past. So help me understand, like, is it a thing or is it not a thing? Yeah, so th this is how I view it. And this, I, I do, first off, let me say, I do have kind of like a hippie perspective on some things where it's like, look, man, like the world made this wide variety of things for us to use and benefit from. And they, there are things we don't quantify in a lot of these foods. Some we do now, like resveratrol and otherwise. But if, if you did a dietary analysis on someone, you wouldn't get resveratrol content, right? You get carbs, proteins, fats, whatever, macro, micronutrients. Because um, those are things that we know have a large impact on physiology and you need enough of. Then there's these other things, like you mentioned resveratrol or um, phytosterols or these other compounds that 
we have some indication that they may have some sort of effect in the body, but certainly they haven't reached a major clinical utility. Otherwise, they would be way more important than they are. But I think there's something to be said for giving your body a variety of all these different things that we don't quantify and we don't know exactly what they do, but clearly they were here helping us come along. And so I do have that just kind of general perspective of like, look, there's all these phytonutrients or uh, technically they're phytochemicals. There are no like phytonutrients. If, if there's any like chem, chem majors on here that are going to like bash me, right? Like, yeah, all right, it's, it's phytochemicals, but I like, it sounds better as phytonutrients, right? So, but th there's, there's zoonutrients too, right? So we have those molecules that come from red meats and otherwise you have bioactive proteins, you have bioactive lipids. You know, we see things like the milk-based proteins do specific effects beyond just being protein themselves. Right. So I think it goes both routes. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily something that's just plants or grains or otherwise. I think it's something to be said for all the eating material we have available to us. And there's so many items we don't quantify. I, I just think they probably have a role in long-term health. Um, and the best evidence we would have from that is like the stuff you have from blue zones or otherwise, where you have these guys, like certainly there's a lot of other things there, lower calories, blah, blah, blah something that's also there is a massive amount of diet variety. And so that, that's kind of my like general perspective on it. But I, I totally agree with you where I don't think there's a clinical utility for finding one of these thousands and thousands of phytonutrients and saying, hey, jam this one and it'll be really beneficial for you. So, so that, that's I, like my general perspective. I love like the like I, I love the ideal. I remember being a 20 year old bodybuilder and, and this personal trainer, I, I not bodybuilder, but somebody in the gym, I've always loved going to the gym and, and the, the, the owner of the gym at the time said, you know, just go to like the ethnic food store by you and go buy some different things that you've never eaten before. You, you don't know what antioxidant is going to be there. And I remember thinking like, Holy crap, I would eat everything in that store. Are you sure that's a good idea? And then uh, fast forward, you know, 20 years later, yeah, I put on 150 pounds. I, do you think it's an actionable, you know, I, I agree with you. No other animal restricts what they eat, right? Do you, have you seen any other species restrict their food intake the way humans do in, your, in any of the research you've done? You know, no, I, I, don't, I don't do a lot of animal research. There's some cool stuff with like mice work that Pennington has done, but that's more manipulating what's in their food rather than having them choose. Yeah, I mean, I've never I, I don't think any other animal would would seek out for whether it's like uh, health, you know, kind of cerebrally driven health goals, modify their intake. Oh, OK. So here. All right, man. Oh, there's this. Oh, so, what was this, so, book? this is so cool. Uh, I think it's called Wild Health. But it's, it's this book. And you know what, before we, if we get a break, I'll run over and I'll grab the book and, and, and I'll reference it for you guys. But it is so cool. And it talks about how animals do things like that. So there'll be animals that are sick and they'll seek out specific foods and eat them. It's not restriction, but there, there's something like where for whatever reason, animals can like understand the impact that different nutrients have on their body. Um, I can't remember if there's anything where they like, if they got sick, they wouldn't eat certain things. They definitely like, well, it's like humans too with pica awesome. or something like that. You have weird stuff where you crave certain things when your salt is low or something like yeah, that. Too, right? Yeah. 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 So there, there's like, I got it. I'll get that book and reference it for everyone. Cause it, it is so cool. I'm a huge fan. I mean, there are certainly certain things like, you know, severe illness, high TNF states like that make you just not hungry. Right. So like, cancer and stuff like that. But, but I mean, the way that the typical uh, person would restrict food, I don't, I don't think I've seen any study. To well, say you're saying it's kind of, it's just nature, right? Like a bear is going to gain a bunch of weight, then they lose a bunch of weight, then they gain a bunch of weight, then they lose. A, I mean, they, they're changing their intake and their activity and all that stuff. Right. But, but, that's, but it's a response. To the it's a response, sir. Yeah. Right? yeah. So I don't know, I've heard a couple of bears. They don't tell me what they're thinking. Or what they're <laughs> but I'm just saying like, we don't, so we don't necessarily do that. So I like this idea of like, okay, maybe include, you know, foods and a variety of foods and maybe that, but we know that including variety of foods stimulates intake. So how do we how do we balance like the, this, you know, this ideal, which I, I get it, you know, like let's include like why would any other organism not want to get the nutrients from, I don't know, cherries or whatever. Right. So why would we, you know, eliminate that? But then you have pretty good data showing that eliminating that helps certain things. So so help me understand. And, and we now have pretty good data saying increased variety increases your intake. 
And if we if we believe in the Kiko model, you know, it's that increased intake that it's really problematic. So help me balance this because uh, you know, you know, eat the rainbow is problematic for me, my own biases, you know. So and and tell me where I'm off. So I I don't th- I don't think you're off. I'll what I'll give here is I'll give my personal perspective as as a dietitian, not necessarily just kind of like the the perspective that I would give that I think are necessary in like dietary guidelines where it's a huge like public facing sort of thing. I, I do think when I work with people on an individual level and it's someone that's struggling with obesity, one of the things you have to do is try and implement some form of restriction. Otherwise you're just, you're just not going to lose weight. Right. Um, and typically when I look at the different food servings, the, the first thing we go after are almost always like carbohydrates, also, also nuts just cause they're, they're really heavy, but we, we cut down grains and we try to keep fruits high, vegetables, high protein, higher, um, and moderate dairy. And so that's just kind of my personal approach to it. And then after you work with someone, and often this is longer than a year, right? They, they get down to a weight that is uh, just a healthier body weight for them. Then we look at transitioning foods back in and helping them improve their diet variety. And now that they've gone through the st- struggle of restriction, it's what I've experienced just in my private practice. It's a little easier for them to have that sort of control, control um, in terms of eating variety without necessarily overeating. And everyone will will fluctuate, right? And so that's why constant contact with a care provider, someone else tracking your weight and saying, hey, you know what? Over the last three months, we're up about 10 pounds. Let's look at what's going on and kind of revisit what we can do. I'm not saying we have to necessarily lose 10 pounds, but we got to make sure we don't stay on that trajectory. Something's wrong. Yeah, that is so huge. That's what Tro and I have been pushing a lot too, is like when you have that constant contact, like we have the continuous glucose monitor, the scale, you know, the blood pressure cup, all those things. And, you know, I'll tell you, and, and Tro, this, I'll, I'll tell you, this is kind of intriguing to me since the holidays. In, in the last week, four people I've seen lost weight over the holidays. And I go, so what'd you do? What'd you change? What'd you do different? Like, we're like one guy went to Mexico, was having virgin margaritas. He was like eating all kinds of stuff that he shouldn't be. He goes, but the, what it told him, he said, the stress I was under. So he took two weeks off of work lowering those stress hormones, cortisol, whatever it is, it made a huge, and I have four patients who had the same experience over the holidays where they weren't going crazy, eating crazy stuff, but they were losing weight where they were plateaued. Boom. They lost weight over the holidays when everyone else gained a few pounds. Right. Wow. That's, that's a rarity. I it's, it's crazy. I've, I've seen it happen one time, actually, actually one of my recent, uh, but these are high stress people that have high stress, like high end jobs where they're running corporations and do all this stuff when they just Shut the, I don't know. That's the only correlation I see that makes sense. There's Jade. I'm I'm sure Jake, you've seen that data on, uh, there's diet holidays are associated with improved long-term compliance, right? So like, you know, if you're so rigid in your goals and you don't take that, this is why, you know, I'm really in favor of the long-term, you know, uh, spare tire approach to low carb quote unquote replacement foods is because if you, you know, those diet holidays and that, that feel like being human and experiencing a holiday with something sweet, you know, it, 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 there is something to that. That's not, you know, that's not, um, that works on maybe a psychological level, a stress level, feeling normal. So, you know, who knows, right? Yeah. Not stressing Uh, about everything you're eating and worrying about macros and all that stuff. I think at some point it's self-defeating. And and I, I love that you called it a diet holiday as opposed to like the, you know, the colloquial term that's used all the time is like cheat meal. And I hate having a negative connotation to like doing something for your body just because it's not like towards a low calorie weight loss goal. I I hate that that's called cheating. You know, I love the concept of a diet holiday, a positive spin, eating differently to keep your compliance going. So I, I, I love that concept. I, I'm probably going to use that term from now on. I hope you don't mind. I like that. A lot. No, it's, it's not me. It's been, you know, studied in, in, in the literature, These, you know, in bodybuilders, for example, those diet holidays are, have shown to, to be effective. It's probably a psychological uh, effect. And you see that, you know, it's funny when, when the bro science people and the fasting people agree, I start to pay attention you know, the fasting people say, you know, don't do chronic restriction, do fasting and feasting, right? Like have periods where you 
eat generously and maybe you'll go exercise a little bit more. And, you know, it's called the reverse diet in the bro science world, which is a period of hypercaloria to prevent the, those chronic adaptions. And I don't think there's any good data. I've searched for data. The only data I've seen supportive of that is this diet holiday data that shows its long-term psychological uh, impacts and, and sort of long-term compliance impacts. But it's, it, you know, when these two people agree, now I'm like paying attention. You know what I mean? Like they, they never agree, right? So um, I think there's something there. So, okay. So I, so I got to, I want to pivot a little bit because you're, you, I saw a poster that you did several years ago on a ketogenic diet. And I'm like, this guy, you know, the balls, man, he's got a thing called Cake Nutrition, right? And CakeNutrition.com is his uh, website and his, and his Twitter handle is Cake Nutrition. And he freaking studies ketosis and liver health. And then I'm like, maybe I shouldn't have been such a jerk. And so we met it. And hey, you were a uh, jerk, actually. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah a little bit. I, I, back, Jake. I, I probably wasn't the nicest. Like, you know, you know so what happened? So how, how did you get your handle, Jake? How did you come up with cake nutrition just to kind of throw it in up a little bit? Yeah. Or just say, hey, no. cake's OK sometimes or what? Hey, cake rhymes with Jake. I was like called oh, cake right. a couple times as a kid by some close friends. It wasn't really like a, a nickname, so to speak, but it was like. If someone called me cake, I would respond to it, right? You and I love, troll, though, man. The, I love the dichotomy. I love the dichotomy of cake mm -hmm. nutrition. I, it's just, it, I just think it's cool. Got it. Normalizing food. I, I think that's the other thing. But we live in such a weight stigma and weight heavy well, diet get, culture. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think that's the thing is that like with my patients, if they go, if they whatever, they have grandma's cookies on Christmas, whatever, or whatever they're doing. I'm like, did you enjoy it? Like so many people, they'll say, oh, my gosh, I felt so guilty. I was so sad. I was like, like just enjoy it if you're going to stink and do it. You, it, it. The effects going to be the same on your body, and it's probably going to be worse if you're stressed about it. Just get over it. Deal with it. And so many people, and as a matter of fact, one of my patients, I love it. The first time I met with her, she said, uh, look, doc, I'm not going to be hardcore keto. I'm not doing that. This is my nature. And she goes, sometimes I don't have a glass of wine. Sometimes I'm just doing this because she's done the whole 30. She's done all these restrictive diets. She can go a month and be like in boot camp, and then on day 31, she's eating cookies and donuts and binging. So she said, I need to be able to say, if I want a piece of bread every two weeks, can I do that? Yeah, go for it. And it's working and she's done fantastic, right? Because she knows her men mental uh, state. And some people have one cookie and they can't stop for a month. It depends who you are ultimately. And, and that was, and, and that could, was yeah. actually, that was the, that was the, the, uh, that was the nature of our first in-person conversation, actually, Brian, what you're just bringing up when I made Jake at, at 2019 AVOM. It was after a lecture where uh, somebody in the audience, a dietitian, said, I don't believe that food addiction is real. And she said, I've never seen somebody, you know, if you tell them, eat all the ice cream you want, that they'll, you know, eat all the ice cream and then keep eating. And it's funny when she Not made in front comment, of you. Right. Not, when she made this comment, I said, you've never met me like I am that person. Right. You know, so I will keep eating ice cream. And uh, I remember talking to Jake about it and he was so his approach was different. He's like, yeah, there are some people. Um, so even the fact that a dietitian acknowledges uh, the, the, the this idea of food addiction, I hate calling it food addiction because we can live without alcohol and heroin. But we have to find a way to live with food. So I don't love the term food addiction, even though that's really what it is. Cravings on par with an addiction. So that that was where and you started. I think it's more processed food addiction. And very few people are like, I'm going to go eat broccoli all night. I'm sure there's people who do. Someone's like yelling at the radio right now. But, you know, I mean, for the most part, it's going to be chips and cookies and donuts and all these stress, you know, comfort foods, we call them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's actually the, the discussion we had literally right in front of the poster. And I'm like, this guy with the cake nutrition handle is doing research on ketones. Like, help me understand this. You know, so actually, so how did so you you you've had some scientific interest in kind of this realm of stuff, maybe personal interest, even hearing your story. So what you know, is there do you find anything do you find that? Uh, your colleagues are less interested in, in low carb phenomenon. I mean, it's clearly you're interested in it. Do you find that like people just don't care? You know, you've, you've worked with John Kerwin's probably studied diabetes for longer than I've been alive. Okay. And has he done any research on ketones before you, you know, during the 10 years you've known him? 
he hasn't I, to my knowledge and John's done so much work. I, I don't, I don't know exactly. Yeah. I mean, like, right. so like back in the eighties, he was doing some of the like really key physiological um, like glycogen and exercise and nutrition handling sort of stuff that, that kind of built up out of um, you know, ball state and the amazing work that's come out of there and exercise physiology. So he's like, he's a giant in the field. <clears throat> so I assume he probably measured ketones in some context somewhere. But I haven't seen like a big publication with him on it. And th there's somewhat of a reason for that, right? Like, so a lot of what goes on in research is a little bit dictated by funding, right? And funding for us primarily comes a little bit from the federal <laughs> government. Right? So you got to convince other people to like give you money to do work on something. So there's a, a lot of reasons why, you know, there may not have been so much research, but there, there have been a lot of research on like ketogenic approaches and ketone body metabolism that were really back in the eighties that kind of really defined the physiology. And it left a lot of, it didn't leave a lot of interesting questions to follow up on. So like Henry Bruningrabber is just one of the most amazing ketone physiologists. Uh, he's out of case Western also. And so, you know, he does tracers and other items to look at what's going on with ketone body metabolism. And what was defined early on is back far back as the eighties was that, you know, they did, um, have you guys talked about like hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamps on here? And should I go into that at all? Do you guys want to hear what? No, this we, we have talked about it. Uh, hyperinsulinemic euglycemic, but only, the only time we've ever mentioned it was Regina Sinha's work on its effects on the brain with uh you know the euglycemic hypoglycemic clamp that she did but yeah oh yeah those are cool um, yeah. okay can i take a brief sidebar and just kind of like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. go into yeah. it man people want to hear from you it's a critical research process that we use to understand someone's insulin sensitivity so when you see huge papers that look at insulin sensitivity like you know like thousands and thousands of people that's not the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp from here out i'll just call it the clamp because it's a beast of a word to say, right? Um, so what they use is, people can piece people don't know what that is, so they don't know what it is. So you have to explain to them what a hyperinsulin, what what this clamp is, what because it's the gold standard for the diagnosis of diabetes. Yes, right. So it's the most accurate test we have. So can you just explain a little bit about what it is? Yeah, definitely. So this is different from like Home IR, which you guys are well familiar with. I'm sure a lot of people are kind of familiar with it. It's just looking at glucose and insulin in your blood at a fasting time point and saying, based on these levels, we kind of think you might have insulin resistance. What the clamp does, this is super cool. So this is an inpatient study. We bring people in, they fast overnight, you control their diet a couple of days before, right? So everything's nice and standardized. You lay them down in a hospital bed and you essentially infuse insulin and glucose into their body. So this clamp in particular is hyperinsulinemic. So what we do is we put people down and we infuse insulin and we want to see what that insulin's doing in terms of carbohydrate metabolism. We're looking for the liver glucose production to turn off and we're looking to see if we shove glucose into the body, can insulin appropriately tell that glucose to go into primarily their skeletal muscles, right? So we typically call it skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity. So the, the term clamp is because it's hyperinsulinemic, high insulin, euglycemic. So when we're infusing glucose into their body, we're also monitoring their blood sugar levels to make sure it doesn't go anywhere different from 90 milligrams per deciliter. So we keep them clamped at 90 milligrams per deciliter. And so based on the infusion you put in, uh, which is a standard dose for everybody, you then give them a variable glucose infusion and how much glucose they can take in and dump into their muscles and still keep their glucose at 90 milligrams per deciliter, that's an indicator of their insulin sensitivity. So long way about it, we're infusing insulin, we're infusing glucose, and that tells us someone's insulin sensitivity, and that's the gold standard. Um, so my reason for bringing that up is because back in the 80s, Ralph DeFranzo and some other outstanding researchers did work to see if changing ketone levels could impact insulin sensitivity. This is important because insulin sensitivity is like the number one primary indicator of whether you will develop like type two diabetes, right? It is the initial physiologic insult that leads to type two diabetes. So if you can prevent that, 
you are really doing a great job. Even if you then struggle with obesity, you can prevent all those nasty downstream items. So they took people, they did this clamp, infused glucose, infused insulin, and then they added ketones and they jammed ketones in there, right? Um, about as much as you would see if you were on a strong ketogenic diet. Uh, and what happened to the insulin sensitivity? Nothing, didn't change at all. And so this is really ironclad work using some of the, the best techniques at the time. It was super novel. Now we use it all the time. But so we know for a fact that increasing ketones does not impact that skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity. So I think because of that work and work surrounding it, you didn't have a lot of interest in you know, using these sort of approaches. Also, low-carb diet at the time was termed to be really unsustainable. It was more of a a gimmick for sales at the time, interpreted, interpreted as such. at the Not time still now, <laughs> you know, still now. Okay. So, but do, like, so, so the point is, is, is people who are taking exogenous ketones are really not going to make a difference. So now, so now here's the cool thing, right? So outside of clamps, people have doing, have been doing this exogenous ketone work or, or otherwise I do work with MCTs in other disease states as well. Uh, sorry. Uh, the medium chain triglycerides. I forget how much is like common knowledge these days. So like fats are really long, right? And medium chain triglycerides are just shorter fats. But what's special about them is they essentially get used instantly as energy, but it's too much energy for the liver. So what does the liver do? It converts it into ketones. So with MCTs, you essentially, and, and again, many of your community may know, know this, mm -hmm. but it's, yeah. it's really just a way to increase ketones, increase ketones without needing to like drop carbs and, and increase fats massively. Um, anyway, so, so yeah, so there's these other ways to address ketones outside of like ketone body infusions um, that seem to be having an impact. Now they're looking at glucose control as opposed to insulin, as opposed to that like gold standard insulin resistance. And when I say glucose control, I mean like your response to a meal, right? You, you eat food, how does your blood sugar change? And there may be an effect there for these exogenous ketones. I, I'm, I'm not personally sold on it, but there's some cool work coming out on it. Um, I think Jonathan Little's lab has done some cool stuff. Uh, if anyone's like reading around and, and, and see the, the name out there. So uh, there's renewed interest in that realm, but I, I still believe in that prior work from the eighties, where if you just jack up ketones, it's not going to improve insulin sensitivity. And this leads to the work I did and the um, abstract out there is because I'm, I'm personally not as interested in what happens when you jack up ketones, but what happens when your normal ketone levels are lower than they should be. And whether that's from excessive carbohydrate intake or some form of insulin resistance, you know, that who, who knows, but what happens when your basal fasting ketones are lower than they should be. And that's the work that I did in NAFLD, which was this um, abstract we were looking at. NAFLD being non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, typically something associated with obesity. Um, but it's it's fat in your liver and it's not good. Right? Or excessive fructose. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, well, what did you come I up with? To, I had to put that study. in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> the low what, 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 podcast, right? What did your study show on that, on the effects of, on, on the fatty liver disease? We showed that people that had that reduced, um, that reduced ability to have fasting ketones at a normal level. We're not talking high. We're talking like 0.25 millimolar as like just a, a normal overnight fasting level. People that had reduced amounts had worse insulin sensitivity. And so that's interesting to me is, okay, maybe it's not jacking up ketones that is potentially having an impact on insulin sensitivity or resistance based on the work that's been done in the eighties. But perhaps now we're seeing a lot of people that just have lower fasting levels. And maybe that's associated with an issue, whether it's a physiology issue that we can address or otherwise. And so um, that's what I'm really interested in investigating. So like, like, I mean, this takes out the whole process of like fat oxidation and adaption. And I mean, it's such a, I mean, I guess like they just didn't know. I mean, uh, but it's like, I, I, I look back on some of this research and I'm like, what were they thinking? You know, like what were they really like, what I, but I guess they just didn't know. So I, I think what you're getting at, which I very much agree with, is right. that there, there ends up being a different physiology of people that don't eat carbohydrates a lot. And this is towards that fat adaptation and otherwise. But so if you have someone on a low carb diet 
for a while and someone that eats normally and you give them both um, like our gold standard is the oral glucose tolerance test, right? You give someone sugar and you see how they respond to it, right? In terms of their blood glucose response. If you compare a person that eats carbohydrates normally and a person that doesn't, the person that doesn't eat carbohydrates normally will perform worse. They will have worse glucose tolerance. And that is like bad clinically. Um, but if does that matter if they're not? No, it's bad clinically eat. if you eat carbohydrates, right? right. Yes. And, and that's, that's the key point, right? So it's well, like, but you could also prime the pump too. And if you eat carbs, cause your body's just not used to making a ton of insulin to get rid of that sugar. So it's just a delayed reaction to that. So if you prime the pump a little bit, some of the studies are showing that if you eat carbs for a few days and then you give that same load, it doesn't, it, they handle it just like everyone else. Yep. D- d- totally agree. And I'm uh, in very much alignment with, with that research as well. Um, so, yeah, but I, but I think, I think that plays to this concept that like, look, this changes how your body is using fuel when you drop these carbs. And I don't think we have the best understanding on what that sort of physiology fully entails for a human, especially one struggling with this obesogenic environment and disease. One of the concerns that I do have is if you have someone on a low carb diet and then you have those diet holidays, right? You're, you're not taking them and like re-implementing carbs. It's just, it's just short-term. They will have a worse response than, than other people. Is that short-term worse response more impactful than all the long-term clearly lower responses? Or that's, that's, that's a question that, that I would have. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'll tell you just clinically, what's interesting to me, I have people that, for instance, they come to me as a poorly controlled diabetic or, or a person with diabetes, I'll say, because people get upset with me if we call people diabetic, but someone with diabetes, their sugars are terrible. They eat the same thing on Thanksgiving a year ago. This year, they eat the same thing and the sugars don't respond so dramatically. But I think part of it's a, it, like this personal fat threshold. When you when you, all your fat storage and your liver glycogen is full, you have nowhere to put this stuff, right? So I think people do get better with time. Uh, yeah, especially they get if you more see weight loss sensitive. and otherwise with it, I, I yeah. totally agree. Like if you have that, then the benefits, like if you have someone lose 10 pounds, that benefit is huge. I mean, that that's insanely huge in terms of their overall health. You know what I mean? So if you can use a low carb diet to lose 10 pounds, then some of these other minor differences that I've just been talking about, I mean, that's essentially irrelevant, right? You've done such a huge benefit to your health by kind of just dropping that weight a little bit. I, I think it, I think it ends up really outweigh or if you or i mean i'm just going to play devil's advocate personal fat threshold or if you empty out visceral fat and even kept the same amount of and displaced that to subcutaneous fat right even that alone would improve you know insulin yeah because we, you know, we uh, insulin sensitivity so we've so, all seen that i've seen people that are 400 pounds that are insulin sensitive I mean, this kind of just that personal fat threshold triggers me brian so because i, I know it triggers you a little bit but but i'm saying i think there's some truth to that i really do because i think once you it, i think of it as like a, if you have a moving truck it's very easy to put stuff in there if it's empty if it's half full you can put you can put more stuff but if once it's totally full yeah you're like where do i put this stuff and you have to hire all these guys insulin to shove them in the truck i think that's the problem is that we we get to that point i think there is a uh, for some people cuz tro we have people that are 140 pounds that have type 2 diabetes like how's that happen right i mean they'd have nowhere to put the stuff it's it just stays in the bloodstream and that's diabetes I, yeah. I could be convinced that's part of it for sure. I'm I'm not I'm not hundred percent sold on that route, but I would be willing to to like entertain future research looking at that. I think a lot of times when we do clinical work, we try and normalize all those other factors, like in terms of available stores and otherwise. So like we do that a lot with glycogen, right? We we stabilize everyone's glycogen stores before we do tests. Um so, you know, you'd have to do that sort of comparison, but I'd be really interested to see like how that would turn out. I, I think it's. Well, and, and what's interesting with your research, what I was thinking while you were saying is, okay, you take someone with no muscle mass and you run that same experiment, you run someone like you who has a ton of muscle mass, you're going to see a huge difference in, in, in what you, where you're going to put that glucose. That's why we talk about weight bearing exercise and activity, you know, the dead on man. Well, is it, is it, so I think I've looked into that 20 pounds of muscle mass, I think is about. 50 calories a day or something like that, you know, 50 calories a day, but it's probably impactful from the, from the, uh, in terms of BMR, but, but it's not the calories we're talking about where you put the excess carbohydrate. Yeah. You make it more easy to basically 
store away that uh, that sugar, right? More muscle mass, easier yeah, to store sugar. Gosh, I give it a talk. It's like, like I think even we have fat, one. Even fat, right? The triglycerides will come down too, most likely. Like I think our bloodstream could hold one teaspoon of sugar, but your muscles could hold 100. And I think your liver can hold 20. So where yeah, do you want to store it in your muscle? That's the safest place to store your glycogen. You don't got to convince me on the benefits of muscle mass, man. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 mean, I can tell by looking at you. Yeah, you know a little bit about this. This is a good. This is a good segue into muscle mass because that's what your your study from earlier this year. Uh, so help me understand: Am I bringing back whole grains to my diet? You know, am I going to bring back whole grains? So should I? You know, tell me tell me about that study because I I know it made a little bit of a splash. It was very well read. Uh, so what did you find? This, this was an awesome study and one that's like really near and dear to my heart too, because I've always been interested in protein turnover um, and I've never been able to like publish a study and conduct a study on protein turnover. So it was a blast for me to like get in that realm. Um, but this was actually a, an original study that was built by John Kerwin, and he wanted to look at differences between a whole grain diet and a refined grain diet. And, you know, the, the general perception we have in the United States and, and the data supports it is that most people eat plenty grains, but they're, they're primarily refined grains. You know, the average serving, I think for a lot of people in terms of whole grains is like uh, one, one third or one sixth can, of anywhere. Can you, help, can you help me understand? Because we use this whole grain term and refined grain term It's really nebulous. Like give me two products I would know. So if you've ate a bunch of, you know, X versus ate a bunch of Y. Yeah. And it's brutal. The definitions are really confusing. Even as myself, you're converting between ounces and grams. And, oh, it's, it's nuts. But in general, right, if, if you can find something that has the entire whole grain kernel, which would be like oatmeal, right? Or if you buy the whole grain not bread. Eat, not, not, not. So you're talking about steel cut oatmeal, not like the powder oatmeal that they. Uh, yeah. Make. Not, 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 not the powder. Not the stuff, like, just, you know, got, grab like, like your, your, your Quaker oatmeal. Like you've got whole grains in there. Right. right um, Cheerios has plenty of whole grains. No, I, I'm oh. joking. They do have whole <laughs> grains in there, but I think there's something different than just having whole grain components and having the entire whole grain. Are you talking about like couscous and crack wheat? And is that like a whole grain? Is that a whole yeah, grain? Yeah, but it, it, it's not, a, it's not as intense as, as you, you would think. Like, so yeah, you, you have all those items, but more so it, it's really just focusing on you just your, your items that aren't processed to be refined. So well, just, I'm, I'm, I'm still struggling to white, right, white rice. listener. Give me more whole grains I could eat from, you know, oatmeal, you know? brown rice, barley, like wheat. So like crack wheat and, uh, and uh, like, like those, those type of, you know, what's that? Couscous is a whole grain, right? You know, the, the Probably. crack wheat, is it? You know, <laughs> you know, so I'm just trying to like, uh, what so, else? so what, what's the outcome? Uh, so, but, okay. So, so, so the yeah, refined so. grain, just so I read, refined grain would be like the granola bar, the average granola bar, right? Or is that also a whole grain? Yeah, probably, probably the average granola bar is probably well, the so advertising, the, the advertising the, is the whole difference. Grain, the difference is whether or not. So like the whole grain has like three components, right? You can look at, you can envision it kind of like an egg, right? It's, it's got this outer shell, right? There's lots of fiber and protein in that. There's uh, an inner uh, germ, which has like some healthy fats and some other items. And then there, the majority of it is just a starchy endosperm. And so the whole grain has all three of those components. Right. The refined grain takes away everything except the starchy endosperm. So these are going to be like your fully finely processed, like you'll see white flour, right? You'll flour. see. So anything with flour is a refined grain. <sighs> anything with, with processed flour. So you, you can mill grains and maintain the whole grain components. So you can have whole wheat contain whole wheat flour contain the whole grain components. Because they're not the sifting it. They're, they're putting the whole thing in there and making it from that. Right. right. Okay. So there's milling and refining. Milling is like the, the breaking that down. You can powderize it. It doesn't matter. Refining is actually pulling off that um, germ, endosperm, mm -hmm. and then you have just that refined grain product, white rice, right? So that's the main difference. It, the, the majority of, like I would say, oatmeals that you buy in like a giant container are probably whole grain, right? The majority of brown rice that you buy in a big container, whole grain, barley, all those sorts of things, right? When then when you come down to the really refined products, like you were mentioning, probably the granola bars that go through a bunch of different processing, you have um, like your your refined grain cereals, 
Like so so those are those are very. If you're good. adding water and boiling and cooking. That's whole grain. Otherwise, it's yeah. If it's a pain in the butt to do. It's whole. That's grain. That's an easy way I, to yeah. do it. Yeah, outside, of, outside of loaves of bread. Yeah, I think that's an easy. That's an easy cutoff to make. Yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. So what happens if I do the whole wheat? You know, should I be eating grains? Tell me. So, so this is what we were interested in looking at was protein turnover. John has already shown that when you have a whole grain diet, it improves cardiovascular health outcomes compared to a refined grain diet. And we matched calories, proteins, carbs, fats, everything was matched. Fiber? Except fiber was a little higher, but it was, it was awful close. It was, it was like statistically different, but it was not, it was not a, uh, a, a, a big difference. Got it. I, I forget the actual numbers, but John's paper was AJCN 2016 on whole grain and cardiovascular health outcomes. But it, so it was statistically different because the diets were precise. Diets were fully provided. We weren't counseling people. We were giving them food and they, and they were eating it. And so cardiovascular outcomes were better. I think blood pressure was the primary one. Um, they've done some work on glucose control and insulin response. This was from Steve Mallon, who is now at Rutgers, I believe. Um, so he's done some cool work there. And then this third part is on protein turnover. And I've always liked protein turnover stuff, right? So um, what, what we showed was that when you have this whole grain diet compared to the refined grain diet is your net balance um, in terms of your protein turnover is greater on the whole grain diet. Uh, and when you talk about whole body protein turnover, you know, where is like protein uh, coming from or going, right? You, you have like, you have your gut, you have your muscles. Um, so it's not all just muscle, right? So we didn't do muscle specific measures of protein turnover. We just looked at whole body protein turnover. Um, but you had a better net positive protein balance on the whole grain diet. And that just as a general sense is long-term, right. Associated with better maintenance of critical, um, physiological, uh, tissues like your muscle and, and other you know organs. Right. So, so that was kind of the cool thing. And this was cool because the vast majority of prior research on protein turnover has looked at protein intake, calorie intake, you know, there was some work on, um, like anabolics and burn patients and otherwise, but no one's really looked at like non protein related, uh, uh, components and the whole grains was a really cool way to, to look at that. So this was really unique in the sense that we were able to show a significant difference on a whole grain diet when protein was matched, when calories were matched. And so that was what was special about it. And so then we took that into the cell culture and now we use muscle cells specifically. And we looked at whether or not if we put phytonutrient components from whole grains onto cell muscle cells in a Petri dish, would that impact protein synthesis? And we can, we can measure that in the actual cell. And it had a significant impact. It, it increased global protein synthesis in these skeletal muscle cells. Um, so that was just a really cool translational sort of project to go from there to there. And so then the thought was, all right, okay, if it does, if whole grains do in fact have this beneficial effect, we should see it when we look at the epidemiology, right? We should be able to see people that have whole grains do better in terms of something like muscle mass or muscle function in older adults. So that's what we did. We probed the NHANES database. And for if um, people aren't familiar with that, it's the uh, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. It's a huge epidemiologic study uh, on people in the U.S. Been going on for decades. They do diet analysis. They do physical measures. They do all sorts of things to just look at what people are eating and how that's impacting their health and a bunch of other items, um, environmental factors and otherwise. So what did we see there? Well, when we looked at older adults, we saw that older adults that had a higher whole grain intake had better muscle function as they were older. We looked at walking speed. So, in, so older individuals were then able to have uh, improved walking speed compared to those that ate refined grains compared to whole grains. We didn't compare refined and whole. Let me state that correctly. People that had more whole grains had the better walking speed as opposed to people that had less whole grains. So, um, and, and, and we, you know, we controlled for uh, protein intake and age and sex and all the standard epidemiological stuff. Um, but they could have also taken a lot of processed grains also. They, they, they right. may have. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we didn't, we didn't compare the difference 
between refined and whole grains. We just wanted to see, does whole grain intake have this effect? So do you think whole grain intake, like if someone's carnivore and added whole grains, do you think that would in- improve their, their protein turnover? You know, so it's, it's so hard to tell because the data that we have is not on people that were on a low carb diet and have that low carb physiology. So I don't want to just like assume that the physiology necessarily translates because we're learning more and more about the differences of like a low carb physiology. Um, In theory, my thought would be if I take a step back and I say, okay, if you want an optimal diet to optimize protein balance in my mind, that would include whole grains. Is that true? If you're primarily doing a low carbohydrate thing, I, I I have no idea. And, And I'll also say that like, this is not like a, cornerstone foundational publication that says this is definitely the case. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And we're all saying, Hey, we're all saying the same thing, whether you're vegan or whatever, it's like saying, cut out the processed junk and eat real food. Like ultimately it's kind of hard to eat a ton of still cut oats compared to what you're going to eat on Cheerios. Right. I mean, there's certain oh, yeah. things like that and the, the glycemic response and all that. So, man, this is good stuff. Well, tell yeah. us about your carnivore stuff. Unless Tro has questions. Well, on. Yeah. Yeah. I got a quick question. All right. So, so, so do you think, like, let, let's just, you know, let's just tease things out. Let's say you took the same amount of calories and now you wouldn't be matching protein and you wouldn't be matching, but you supplemented meat, right? What do you think the outcomes would be? And then help me understand, do you think it's something in the whole grain that is better or something in the refinement that causes something worse? So you get what I'm saying? So yes, is it, so, so you mentioned like you injected muscle cells with whole grains versus refined grains. So, and you saw a better improvement. Is there something with refined grains that harms or is it something in the whole grains that helps? So this is going to go back to my, like, just kind of hippie perspective on, on food and phytonutrients and otherwise is I, I would believe it's something inherent to the whole grains. Uh, one of those phytonutrient compounds that is having an effect on the cells, a positive effect. Um, we did screen a handful of uh, phytonutrients that we thought might be the like pivotal factor that's impacting the, the cellular protein turnover, um, but th- those didn't come out. What, what was really significant was when we used a, an entire whole wheat extract. So we, we purchased, this was actually a product from Germany, um, but they had an extract, a whole grain extract of uh, whole wheat. And so we took that and we made it into the cellular media and put that on the cells. And that contains all the different phytonutrients, right? We did profiling of what was in there. Um, it was a lot of uh, like lipid sort of components. So my thought, and again, this is just what I think, right? This isn't tried and true and proven through a bunch of research studies that verify it, but I would think it's something inherent to the whole grains that has an effect. Now to your question on red meat, if you did the the same sort of type of study and did red meat, you know, we, we have data out there. Quantify the effect. Like let's say I gave somebody the same amount of calories of leucine on MPS. Like what are we talking about here in terms of that effect, right? Is it like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, people want to, you know, I don't know, eat like take ready, you know, when their cholesterol is high versus, you know, a, a, you know, a uh, HMG CoA reductase inhibitor, which would have a, you know, 10 times the effect. Like what is the effect of that? Yeah, we, so we don't really know. So we, we measured body composition and this wasn't in my report. This was in John Kerwin's initial report from 2016, but we looked at body composition differences between the whole grain and refined grain group. It was an eight week study. Um, and there were no significant differences in body composition over those eight weeks. They weren't resistance training. They weren't exercising, right? It was just a diet study. So I would be really interested to follow up on that end and see if we can find some sort of effect size for having whole grains when you have an entire environment that's going to build muscle, you know, is this an effect that can improve muscle building? That would be really cool. And, and it'll be we, don't, we don't have anything to support that, but that would, that would be cool. Right? It would be interesting what, to what about weight loss? Is this something yeah. where you can improve protein balance during weight loss? We don't know. And we do, I, I want to be very clear. We don't have data that would suggest it does either of those. But when you look at the study we did, which was non-exercising, isocaloric, and you see this difference in protein turnover, 
to me, that's really interesting. Yeah. So I, I, I can't answer your question. But I think it's, so, I think it's like a great so right question. now, right now, our understanding is there's some between whole grains has something in it. Okay. That is beneficial or refinement is particularly harmful. We're not quite sure. I, I would, I would believe that whole grains have something in it. I think there's enough profiling we've done on whole grains and those components in other studies to say that there are things in whole grains that have a positive effect. Do we know which one, or is it a mix of all of them that we don't know? But when you look at the difference between whole grains and refined grains, there's really not components in refined grains that aren't in whole grains, unless you talk about like other items in the food product. Maybe yeah, we're destroying an, something that we don't really know. Well, you know, and that, it's an interesting thing because I've been intrigued by this and Tro, you may have seen the same. I have people that go to Italy, for instance, for a week and they're eating pasta and bread and 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 uh, pizza and their Eight sugars. They're different, man. There's, there, there's different. something different about it. Or yeah. the other possibility is that they're when they're in Italy, they're not stressed, they're relaxing, they're looking over the countryside and they're chilling a little bit more too. Walking Maybe that has something too. to do with it. It may yeah, be both. But the, but the people in his study aren't like, you know, any less are more stressed right they're randomized so you, yeah no no i mean but there has to be some but i'm looking just at the glycemic i don't know that you guys looked at that the glycemic response will be different i would think that, that the response that, that when you give them a glucose oh yeah might we be know that on whole yeah, grain yeah, versus absolutely. process right. you're right the refined grains are always more glycemic there's less more and hunger. more addictive too yeah more hunger after so there's a difference there's Quicker definitely a difference hungry. So got it. Okay. So I'm going to segue here. Cause I know Brian's like, uh, uh, wants to know, he's got another podcast, I'm sure. And like, no, you know, I got patience, man, but, but we have our Patreon people. We want to, if they have questions, I want them to be well, able hold to on. Let's, let's, find, let's find out about the carnivore study. So how did you, yeah, that's what I want to hear. let's, let's ha- So how did you get involved in this? What piqued your interest? You know, I mean, you're, you're, you know, um, you're in basically Louisiana, which is the, uh, the, <laughs> You know, what is it? The king cake capital of the world? Is yeah, that what we started called? selling them in the stores already, man? It's crazy. Yeah. So so what so how did you get interested in this? And and for somebody who wants to include foods, these are it's a huge population of people who specifically exclude foods. So help me understand what piqued your interest. So honestly, man, it's I love everything about nutrition, right? And so there are Um, you know, you hear about the carnivore diet on Twitter and I'll I'll start off by saying, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of all the messaging that comes out of different like camps on social media. Right. But I am interested in understanding about nutrition and what has been so interesting about this group is these self-reported effects that their specific diet has on their body. And it's very different than anything we've seen before. Right. It's kind of the um, counter to like a, a vegan diet. Right. So, you know, this is, is very different. Um, and so it was really just wanting to understand the, the diet patterns of these people that led me into it. And I, I talked with, um, people in that community and you guys may know, uh, Travis Statham. I love talking to anyone about nutrition all the time ever. So like if anyone's on this and want to email me, like do it, I will chat with you. And so that just kind of evolved into this discussion. And I, I do, um, large scale nutrition assessments. So it's like electronic. I can get people's diet records and all that sort of stuff. And I wanted to do that for a carnivore population. And um, then Travis is like, Hey, you know, we have uh, uh, David Ludwig and, and, um, and otherwise that are just building this separate question that is more on the effects and self-reported effects of people on the carnivore diet. So that, that wasn't my initial idea. I really wanted to quantify the diet. Um, and I'm still looking for ways to be able to do that. But getting on um, this study, which used more of like a kind of food frequency questionnaire sort of item and all these like self-reported physiological items, you know, how did you feel before and after? How were your labs? How was your body weight? And so, and we just wanted to characterize it, right? We just wanted to see what the people that eat this way, how do they perceive their diet has helped them? And, and so that's what the study did. It sent out a survey to this large community of individuals on a carnivore diet. And we were able to show really positive self-reported aspects to consuming this carnivore diet in this select population. But there's something unique to be said about, you know, putting that to paper and putting that out there so that other people can see this isn't just random people on social media or otherwise that are eating a certain way and reporting this. There's a large number of them. 
And so that's, in my mind, one of the initial steps into better understanding the physiology of what that sort of diet does is just first characterizing it and then moving from there. So personally, in my mind, the next step is to get a really detailed understanding of their diet, not necessarily just these food frequency questionnaires, but more of our gold standard, the multiple 24 hour dietary recalls, which is where essentially we ask you, what did you eat yesterday? Midnight to midnight, tell me everything. And then people get that multiple times over the course of a a long period. So that's in my mind, the next. Did you have a heart attack when you saw these people just eating meat, you know, Uh, (laughs) not sharing your hippie principles, you know, like, like, it's like, Oh my God, the rainbow! So, so what were what, so and what also happened? what were the big things that that you, that you that that people self reported that you say, wow, that's kind of interesting because I know Tro and I have talked about this a lot in the podcast, some of the stuff we've heard, and I said, Tro, let's say, let's try to figure this out. So, anything that that you heard that people like that was a theme that people said this got better. Uh, the the reduction of prescription medications, and uh, again, this is my like hippie, hippie perspective, and I'm like. The less drugs I think you, and I, I don't mean to disregard the powerful impact that drugs have to improve. But you your can't be a hippie and talk bad about drugs, man. Yeah, right. you gotta be pro drug, though. <laughs> so, so I, I want to make sure I'm clear about that. But like, if you can get to a point where you can take less of them, that's huge. Well, we, that's we're two docs here. We're 100% in the same idea, right? We, it's like, let's get rid of the drugs if we can. Why take yeah. a drug if you don't need it anymore? So the yeah. med tapering, that's pretty interesting. I've seen the same. Yeah, and so, so that, that, was, that, was the, that was the biggest thing that popped out to me. Was there any other common report that you thought was interesting? You know, I, I, I know I've seen joint pain, reflux, and mood were like- Mental, anxiety, stress, and, we've, we've stuff, and last, eczema, a, a lot of eczema improvement. The last, last five years, we've seen so much data on the mental health benefits of diet. So what did you, did, were those quantified, those particular areas? Yeah, you know, there was, there was so much in there and, and I didn't, I didn't design or, or implement those surveys. This was um, the first author, uh, Belinda. Um, so she, she did that. So I, I don't have like all that knowledge stuck in my head, to be honest with you. There were a ton of different things they measured, but um, yeah, like for anyone interested, read the report and look through there. There were a handful of items that came out significant, but like, the, yes, everything you said was mirrored in there. We had GI, skin, all these or, or other items. Oh, and one important thing too is, you know, we looked at common symptoms that would be associated with nutrient deficiencies. And I think this was a big point as well with the study is we didn't find um, people getting worse on common symptoms that would be associated with nutrient deficiencies. Like gum bleeding and stuff like joint pain. Yeah. yeah, So so like, so these are, so these are things, yeah, a lot of it is um, dermatological, but so this is interesting because when you, when you take a step back and you do a diet analysis, you're like, man, this diet is deficient in so many items. Like that's a major issue. And, you know, we, it's, it's impossible to really tell from this sort of study, whether or not people are consuming these nutrients in other amounts in different ways, whether it's a diet holiday or otherwise. So they're getting enough, right. We don't, we don't know. Or if they're really consuming less than our standard recommendations and not having symptoms, potentially because of that long-term different physiologies. So that's a really cool question that comes out of this is, okay, are these people eating these nutrients that we consider so essential or are they just not having, you know, the bad clinical stuff. symptoms, but do they have subclinical symptoms? We just don't know. Yeah. And, and it can it be that, that the processed foods ask, acting as an anti-nutrient, right? So it's causing other problems. So if you get rid of that, then you don't need to have all these extra nutrients sometimes. I don't know. Cause Sean Baker seems to, he, he appears to be fairly healthy to me. You know, I, I have to be honest with you. I, the only people I've seen nutritional deficiencies are in severe metabolic syndrome. And we see vitamin D being low and they adopt a low carb diet, vitamin C kind of being a little low, folate being a little low. And the other thing I'll tell you to be careful about is I've had people on desiccated organs thinking they were getting enough folate. They weren't. Right. We've checked that so much to tell you that uh, I, I don't even tell people to consider it, really. Uh, but we've seen ice, like a few cases of vitamin C deficiency, folate deficiency I've seen. And that, that's that's a dangerous one, man. That that's the one that scares me. Um, folate or vitamin C? 
folate, especially when you talk about like women of, of childbearing age. And so like, that is the one that I get most concerned with. Um, and for, for people that are less, honest, familiar, it's rarely the young women. It's, it's, it's typically, you know, somebody who has metabolic syndrome older. And I, 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 if I had to like my hippie theory would be metabolic syndrome and hyperinsulinemia is literally depleting nutrients. And when they go on a diet acutely, they're basically restricting in the face of depletion. Right. So, so those are the people that I've seen it in, and this is just my own clinical. And we see that with vitamin D, like the yeah, young think- kids with metabolic syndrome. I have a 24 year old, 27 year old kid who came to me just yesterday. I saw him finished up after six months. His A1C was nine when he started and his now his A1C is six and a half. His CRP was 10. Now his CRP is three. And this is the huge kicker here. His vitamin D was 18 when he started. It was a hundred. It was a hundred in six months, right? Like, I mean, and it's, you can't explain that with, with, you know, some steak and some eggs, right? Like you can't, like, there's something depleting the vitamin D and it's the winter. This is, this is where the research questions come from, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, these are the, that, that's, what's so great. And that's why, you know, that's why in medicine, we've lost the ability to openly debate and discuss to say, Hey, look, what are you seeing? What am I seeing? And let's put these together because you know, the vitamin D issue, we know, we, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't think it's controversial anymore saying low vitamin D is a huge risk factor for dying of COVID, right? Which is associated with high visceral fat, high insulin levels, insulin resistance, and all this stuff we're talking about. So we're, we're all coming back to nutrition saying, Hey, how come we're not looking at this? We should at least look at this as a supplement vitamin D or get metabolically healthy. And you don't need to supplement maybe like with trosing. If you go up to a hundred, that kid is in a lot different shape than he was when you came in. And vitamin D, we're learning so much more about. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll remember back in my undergrad, they changed the the recommended intake for vitamin D, and that was huge, right? It was like, whoa, we previously defined the amount you need for this essential nutrient, and now we're increasing it, and that was really cool at the time. And we're just learning more and more and more and more about it. So, uh, yeah, vitamin vitamin D especially is a big one, and I think. The more we know about that, the better. I mean, I, I'm, I like supplements like dietary supplements. Again, this is my, you know, off label bias. Stuff. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I, I, I like, I like multivitamins. I like CD and fish oil. And like, that's kind of what I, what I like outside of yeah. like So, protein. so, so one of the things we've done is we've used in this clinic, either lab door, which verifies the contents of supplements or consumer lab, which is a not-for-profit it's super subscription based uh, but they analyze the contents of supplements to make sure you're not getting screwed. So, uh, you know, that, and that's the thing. I've seen so many, you know, people who were concerned about folate deficiency and, you know, had elevated homocysteines, you know. I've what, been, what's our best uh, uh, natural source of folic acid? It's, right. it's green leafy vegetables. Green leafy vegetables, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Green leafy vegetables and, uh and everything else is fortified, right? So that's yeah, the it's, yeah. right. Oh, sorry, Jake. Jake's a fucking PhD. I, I'm ta- oh, oh no. come on, man! You almost got through the whole Jake, thing. I'm fucking talking here, Jake. Oh my <laughs> gosh! Twice in a second, in like thirty seconds. Please. Sorry, Jake. Tell us. Dude, what, you're relapsing, what, man. Yeah, if you're on a low carb diet, where can I get folate from? Where can I get vitamin C from? Can you you know help help me understand? Right, I I don't want the sugar. I don't want the starch. Where am I going to get it from? Uh, I, I wouldn't risk it. I would, I would take, I would take a multivitamin, but you know, the, <laughs> that's, that's just, that's, that's what, that's what I would do. And the majority of people that I work with that we put on like weight loss specific low carb diets, I, I always recommend a multivitamin. I, I don't like risking things, especially when it comes to folate because of how impactful they are. You just pee out the extra, fetal, right? On fetal development. So yeah, I think it's a huge deal. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't like to risk it. But, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's ever, it's fortified all over. It's fortified all over the place. Now, as you said, green leafy vegetables is, is good, but um, the grains are good too. And, and otherwise, so obviously that doesn't fit into the low carb profile, but. So the I green leafy just, does green leafy. Yeah, does. it totally does. Yeah, uh, it totally does. Yeah. What about vitamin C? Where can I get my vitamin C? I would, I would, do, the, I would do the berries. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you guys have seen the like research grade ketogenic diets that they do that include you know, like a half cup of berries every day and, and you, you can get them that route. You know what I mean? It's not like you have to consume tons and tons and hundreds and hundreds of, of grams of uh, fruit to be able to, to get this amount. You know, we're talking about you know, eat an orange, right? Like it's, it's not going to be so many carbohydrates that it's going to said fruit is poison. I heard my friend told me that. 
<laughs> yeah, that that's the internet. The, 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 the amount the amount can get brutal, right? Like if you're eating a whole like honey. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, it's it's, it's so, just eating for. Well, so I, you know, I've I've looked into that raw raw peppers, more vitamin C per calorie. Yeah, so you tell people, and yeah, they're good them, too. Yeah, you guys eat raw you peppers though. I, I can't eat the raw peppers. I gotta cook oh, yeah. them. Let me tell you, and the little drop ones. sugar, the little ones are crack. You know, the yeah, they're really good. So oh, okay, the tiny ones. Yeah, they're so sweet, but but I, you know, now I eat a that bitterness has gone away. You know, it's been seven years I've been low carb. But I don't know, Brian. I can eat a green pepper; it tastes sweet to me. Yeah, really sweet Star. to me too. I mean, yeah, like, uh, but if you cook it, the vitamin C is gone. So I'm with you. I I uh, recommend supplements, and if you're going to use a supplement, then you know, uh, sure especially good. if you're looking. To lose I'll, I'll tell you guys a supplement. One of my guys, he, his sugars kept going up at like right, right before dinner time. His sugars were going crazy. Like certain days they would certainly he goes, doc, this is crazy. I'm eating the same food. I'm eating the same thing. And one day it spikes and one day it doesn't. I don't know why he has a continuous glucose monitor. He was taking gummy vitamins and they had so much sugar and it was actually showing up on the continuous glucose. He was taking a bunch of vitamins, but they were all gummy forms. Like, just take real vitamins. You don't need to have gummy vitamins. Just those real. gummy vitamins are brutal, man. They're <laughs> yeah, tons they're my of kids sugar, are like, man. Dad, can I have two? I'm yeah, like, give me all. I'm, I'm gonna have all kinds of vitamins. Yeah, yeah. Here. yeah, that's a trick for kids. As adults, can't fall for that unless you're metabolic. Unless you look like Jake, you can't eat that. Yeah. Sure. So, no. hey, Drew, we have some questions from our, our Patreon people, man. Yeah. One wait. One quick thing. One one last thing. Okay. So the one last thing about folate, just because we were talking about it. There are some people, even when you supplement folate, they don't metabolize folate. So if you have a high homocysteine and a low folate, uh, despite supplementation, consider genetic testing. Talk to your doctor, consider genetic testing. There's some people who do not methylate folate. So you can take all the supplements you want. You may not even be getting it. So uh, that's something to, to consider. Yeah, Jake, we got a question here. Okay, so one of our uh, this is Chris Cornell. If you guys don't know him, uh, he's been on Life's Best Medicine podcast, our podcast, other podcasts. He's helped my practice out. My practice. practice. He does everything. You know? uh, so any recommendations for someone on a high protein, low carbohydrate diet with respect to adding fiber? Would it be reasonable to experiment with simply experimenting with, say, a large bowl of steel cut oats meal once a day? We're more likely to help by splitting it up into two or three smaller servings. Um, I'd wonder what the goal is there, Chris, but yeah, what's your, what's your take? Cool. Uh, and thanks for the question, Chris. Uh, great to, great to chat with you. We interact on Twitter uh, all the time. So really, really cool stuff. Um, I would say, you know, one thing you can do if you want to stay the really low carb route and still get your fiber in is you can get that, you know, insoluble fiber, your, your greens, your, your fruits, your vegetables, those sort of items that are, that are lower carbohydrate and calorie in terms of like, I, I think, I think oatmeal is a great way to do it. Um, I don't think you need like that much. So if you have a, a low carbohydrate goal where you're staying like, you know, 50, 75 grams of carbs, which I think is a reasonable spot for a lot of people, depending on what your particular goal is, um, yeah, I would, I would just toss that oatmeal in. And if you want to split it out across multiple meals, I think that's a fine route too. It depends on whether or not you care about the short-term blood sugar changes and how much of oatmeal you're putting in there. Right. So if you're going to have like two giant bowls of oatmeal, um, is it better to do it at once or spread out throughout the day? I, it's, it's so hard. It's so hard to tell. Um, it just depends on what your goals are. If you want to see less glucose excursions in terms of less number of them, then do it all at once. If you don't want to see you go past a certain blood sugar level, then maybe spread it out. But that's a way to get sort of that soluble fiber, which has its own important heart health benefits. So like, I love something like oatmeal and it doesn't necessarily even have to be something you have every day. Right. But I think finding a way to fit that in would be great. I'm a fan of putting carbohydrates in before and after workouts. Um, Chris, I know you're an, an avid, uh, I think you both weightlift and run. Um, if you have that before or after, I mean, the impact on your blood sugar gonna is going to be so negligible. Yeah, gonna be nothing um, that would be the time that I would look at doing it. Uh, you know, with something like oatmeal, it's a little heavy. You might not want it before a run. It's personal preference, but that's, that's what I would do. Oh, Jake, while we're on that, just one question. The question that always comes up when people go carnivore is everyone's worried about not getting that fiber and they're being constipated. And when you guys did that survey, was constipation a problem for the carnivores? You know, it was re it was reported. I can't remember if it was a major issue, which 
probably means it wasn't super impactful. Cool, um, thanks. Yeah, I was I was curious on that because most people I talk to, their gut health gets better. Yeah, we we did have people report it, and I mean, you know, one of the reasons you you could see that is you know, you have underlying or subclinical like food or nutrient intolerances, not nutrient, just let's just say food intolerances um, that maybe just go unrecognized and can cause some GI related symptoms. And we have ways to address that. If someone came to me as a dietitian and said, hey, I'm having these problems, we have ways to address that systematically. But you have something like this carnivore approach that just essentially takes what we would do over the course of, you know, a period of six months or whatever, and just wipes out everything. And so if you had one of those intolerances, they are now gone. And whether that better. for your physiology is better than having more fiber, you know, people have different responses. And I think that's important to recognize. Like the really important thing with this carnivore study is to say, like, we're not saying by any means that the carnivore diet is necessarily healthy or that everyone should do it. It's saying we have people that are self-reporting to benefit from it. Yeah. And if you have certain conditions that benefit from it, you might try it. And if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. If it works great. You, 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 you got rid of your problem. I would always just recommend working with a physician and or a dietitian for that. There's just so much that, that people don't really know um, that, that we as dietitians can help with, or, or you guys as physicians can help with. So if you want to do this, like talk to your care provider, ask them the question, ask them if they know someone that you can talk to. And if they're really standoffish, like find another care provider to ask. I don't think that's a big issue. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's hard for people to advocate for themselves. And I think this is one of the issues just like in general with people's health is dude, doctors are overstressed, man. It's crazy. You guys see so many patients. It's nuts. So like a lot of times you, you do get sort of generic responses. And so advocate for yourself, get or responses where they have no knowledge in that area. They go, that's not good. Well, why not? I don't know. It's just not good. Well, that, because that I haven't studied it, so I don't want to talk about it. That's I what happens a lot. Confidence is the, a big problem here, Jake. And I, I, the one thing I found is, you know, as a I was 350 pounds, board certified in internal medicine, uh, interested in nutrition my entire life. I had no clue about how, what low carb is, how it works, what it does, anything about nutri nutrition, ketosis. Carnivore five years ago was a, a crazy, six years ago was crazy. I mean, now you put out research saying that it's, you know, kind of reporting on how people feel on it, but most people don't even know about it. Problem is, is, most practitioners are terrible. And, and and if you came to me five years ago, I would have been that person. And I'm telling you, you know, I'm learning from like Amy Berger. There's different people where they go, you're mismanaging this, the thyroid or whatever. And I think there, it's so important. We have to keep an open mind and look and say, okay, if people aren't, if there's everyone's responding great, you say, okay, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. But when you start seeing those different things, you say, could it be weird stuff? Like some kind of, you know, candida infection or whatever. I mean, all those things that nutritionally, and I think that's a big part. I think throw mark my words in a year, we'll be talking about this of saying, when you change your diet, you cut out the processed food is going to ch change your gut microbiome, but it also say you have parasites or say you have some kind of a weird uh, uh, yeast infection, different things like that. When you change your diet and you take away the food source for these things, I think we're going to learn a lot about addiction. And I think part of the food addiction is if if you have uh, bacteria or different things that are giving off hormones, trying to get you to eat more to feed them, right? And so you're just the the you're, you're the, the carrier. So I've seen a lot of stuff along these lines that, but no one's really kind of tied all these things together about getting proper nutrition. And, and Jake, having good nutrition, if people have good nutrition, they're not craving and they're not starving all the time. So when people are sick, they really are hungry all the time because they just don't feel good. And they think if I eat something, I'll feel better, but it doesn't work. It makes you worse. So I think we get into so much of that. I think we're going to learn a lot where we say, oh my gosh, the stuff we didn't really understand, we're starting to put two and two together sometimes. It might take more than a year, but I, Jake, but I, I think it's a great perspective. Jake, give us their last words. How do people find you if they want to get in touch with you? And can I give them a little preview? Me and Jake are potentially going to work together uh, on a project. And I'll pray for you, I'm Jake. I'm not going to let you guys know what it's about. But uh, I'm now an industry sponsor, you know, um, but and a collaborator. So so uh, and I'm grateful for that. It's 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 crazy how, you know, uh, the world works. You know, you meet people, you're like, I'll never agree with this guy. He's got a name, Cake Nutrition. And then two years later, you meet them. And then three years after that, you're like, Shit, maybe we can do something good together. 
Well, and that's why that's why social media is so hard because you could get everyone gets so defensive on something, just saying, "Okay, that's your perspective. Teach me, teach me your perspective, and we can learn from each other." You know, because I think you know, I, I, I a lot of us have been guilty about criticizing the nutritionist and the dietitian and whoever uh, other specialties. Uh, endocrinologists. And so like, let's, let's try to work together and figure this out. Like we, our, the lives are at stake and we have to figure this out. It's not about egos anymore. We got to figure it out. So I think that's why when we start coming together and talking and having open debate, then we could say, Oh, that makes a point or no, you're an idiot. I'm not going to follow that. Or I try it. It doesn't work. Okay. I'll try something else. I think we have to, as adults, we have to be able to figure these things out. And can you have cake sometimes? Tro, can we have cake sometimes? Uh, just keep a low carb. <laughs> Low carb. Yeah, you, know, you don't want the refined flour, right? You don't want the refined flour. No, no, no. It's our shake. Well, you not don't. Cake, you yeah. don't want whole grain cake either. That is not. That's not, yeah. a, that's not it's a not as good, right? You're gonna do it. Do it, right? You know, we can we can get you great almond flour cake. And actually, almond flour diets have been shown. Low carb almond flour diets have been shown to improve depression scores. Just an FYI. I anyway, might test it out. Like I, I love cooking, so I might, I might grab something like that and do some side by side comparisons. Yeah, yeah, you might have competition, that. troll. Listen, it's man, good, I, man, I, I live with it. It's too good, and and I tell people treat it like a spare tire. Anyway, um, Jake, thank you so much. How do people find you? Oh, um, Twitter at Cake Nutrition. You can shoot me an email, just Jake May at Cake Nutrition um, Otherwise, just like look around. I mean, I'm on Facebook and otherwise, but I don't really do that. I would go Twitter or email. Um, yeah, but re- reach out to me and thank you guys so much for having me on. This was an awesome conversation, oh, It was fun, especially man. people with some similar perspectives and some different, I, I love that stuff. Yeah. That's what we need more of. We need to learn from each other. Go, it's working. If you're, what you're doing is working. I'm like, Hey Jake, teach me what you're doing, man. Right. We have to be able to say, Oh, just because I said something a year ago, doesn't mean I have to stick with that the rest of my life. I mean, perspectives change. So I think it's fun. It's good. And, and learning about the micronutrients and understanding how do we, ultimately we're figuring out how do we have the healthiest diet for that patient in front of me. So it's really helpful. Your, your input of, of, you know, make sure you get enough folic. I mean, these are important things that people don't think about if you're just doing it on your own. So I think that's why you need to have specialists. And I think the other thing, big, huge thing that you said is, is the monitoring and following up. That is the biggest part of this in Western medicine. We don't have time to see you all the time. So we're saying, okay, we'll see you in six months. We'll see you next year. Good luck. Good luck this year. <laughs> like if they come back with diabetes. So I think it's, it, you know, we have to change how we're managing and, and what we're doing. So I, I think it's so huge. And I love the research you're doing and, and looking at diverse areas saying, okay, I'll look at this. I'll look at, I mean, that's what you do and say, okay, this seems to be what works. So everyone keep your, keep your, your minds open and, and, and don't just be narrow minded, just observe and look and say if it works or not, you know, Tro, you want to close this man? Absolutely. This is great. This has been awesome. Jake, uh, uh, awesome work, uh, continued awesome work, a career of awesome work. And, uh, hopefully, uh, you can tolerate me enough to, to do some, some of this work that we've talked about and, uh, hopefully it comes, comes through guys, Patreon supporters. Thank you for supporting our not for profit podcast. And, uh, we are very grateful. All right. Bye. Thanks, everyone.